water. What comes to mind when you utter this word? Life, of course. Do you know that by 2025, half the world's population will be living in water-stressed areas? Today, one child under five dies from a water-related disease every two minutes in developing countries. And one-tenth of the world's population lacks even a basic drinking water service. It is simply not enough to merely state or listen to these facts. Time to do something about it. Every drop counts. Every drop is hope. Vera aqua, vera vita, meaning true water, true life, is an organization doing its bit to see the drops of hope giving life. Hi, I'm Paige. Truly honored to be able to converse with phenomenal change makers across the globe via Chizuba Talks. On today's episode, I have Jacob Niemir, founder and executive director of Vera Aqua Vera Vita. Jacob is a practicing engineer, having studied at the prestigious Purdue University, and has a great passion for problem solving and adventure, whether it is with water the environment, travel, or people. While at Purdue, Jacob also recognized the needs and suffering of people in developing countries when he took trips to both Haiti and Africa, which he credits as his inspiration for starting Vera Aqua, Vera Vita. Welcome to Jezuba Talks, Jacob. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Jacob, like you said, uh, your trip to these countries, Haiti and uh, Africa, changed the way you saw people and the problems and the issue of water, isn't it? Yeah, and it really opened my eyes to the reality of life for the majority, actually the super majority of people living in our world. You know, growing up in the United States of America, uh, having all the basic necessities of life met, you know, at the literal turn of a faucet, at the push of a button. Um, can't, couldn't even really imagine life without that. And then just saw that that firsthand when I went on a trip to Haiti. And if, if I may share a quick story of something that sure. vividly strikes me, um, every time I think about what began this journey for me, what was kind of that mm -hmm. inceptional and seminal moment for me mm -hmm. was when I, we flew into Haiti, Port-au-Prince, the capital, it was a year after the devastating earthquake of 2010. Some of the listeners may remember this. Um, that kind of wrecked most of the country and, and the capital of Port-au-Prince was mostly still in ruins. A year later, we're driving through Port-au-Prince to go up into a a small mountain village where we're going to be doing our work, rebuilding a school, rebuilding a church, rebuilding a library. And on this journey through the outs, the edges of Port-au-Prince to get out into the countryside, we get to the outskirts of the city and there's a blue UN tent farm. These emergency UN tents that have been put in over a year before we're still there the people were still most of the people were still living in them so i'm kind of painting a picture for just the the gravity of the situation there mm. and then i just vividly remember this woman walk out of her un tent carrying a big five gallon bucket walk down to the canal that's flowing through the outskirts of the city there and fill that bucket up with water and walk back to her tent and i'm not joking when i say that this water looked like chocolate milk it smelled like raw sewage it had trash and other you know junk and crap floating in it you know kids are playing in it animals are defecating in it upstream you could see people washing their clothes and their dishes in it and very likely okay. humans were probably going to the bathroom right next to it too if not like right in it um and you know i knew that that's what she and probably the majority of people were drinking, even if they were boiling it or filtering it at home. I, I just knew that that was not going to, not going to be good for them, you know, and that, that was like my first real exposure to the need 
I kind of been learning a little bit about it in school at Purdue, in my department. We would talk about some of these issues at a global scale and how do we engineer solutions to them. But then it was really that firsthand subjective real world with my own two eyes experience that really made it made it real for me. Absolutely. It must be very shocking. I I mean the way the way you describe the picture itself is shocking. So in reality it must be even worse. Uh well, so what did you do after that? That was the first thing that you saw and you decided that you want to change these uh, situations. Uh, what was the first step that you took after that? Yeah, so I came back from that trip not exactly sure what to make of what I had just experienced. So it wasn't just you know the encounter with the need, but then I got to meet the people and I got to interact with the people and I got to see despite how little they had, how much joy and gratitude they had. Um, it was really heartening for me. Um, and I learned a lot, honestly, from them um, about, about how to be more grateful for even just the littlest of things and to, to have joy in even the small ways. Um, but it, it moved me even more to like want to help them, you know, out of love and, and care for them. And so... I kind of had this like general idea of like, I need to do work with the global water crisis. Like I, I, I just kind of felt this like initial call that, you know, look, I have a skill set that I was at least honing and learning at the time in water resources engineering in school. Um, mm -hmm. I had a, clearly I had developed and discovered a passion for doing service work like this on this trip to Haiti, which really untapped a lot of that. And I had the drive to do it and I, and I believed that I could. And so I, I kind of took that call upon myself um, to like just learn more about the global water crisis and felt like I needed to go on another trip to another country to really further strengthen that, that um, inspiration that I experienced in Haiti. And so that following summer, actually, um, after working for about three months with a team of students. Um, I got on a team that we put together a, a grant application to go and do a water research project in Togo, Africa. So about six months later, after I got back from Haiti, I was in Togo, Africa for three weeks doing a water research project. And, and that really was kind of the, the final part, the final piece that really solidified that this is the path that I wanted to go down. Um, and at the time I, I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure if that would me be me working for another organization or volunteering for an organization or just doing it like occasionally on like trips throughout the year, going on one or two trips a year, but I knew I wanted to be involved in it and actually kind of underlying all that was maybe a little bit of a, a whisper that maybe I should start my own organization in, in this sphere of work. And so that was kind of the initial inklings towards that began in that first six months to a year after that trip to Haiti. Okay. So you, you took your time to uh, understand the situation and then develop uh, solutions to it. Now, when you say you have developed some sort of solutions, uh, is this a mechanism that uh, helps to purify water or is it some sort of rainwater harvesting system that you have helped with? Yeah, great question, Tej. So we don't actually have a particular technology or a, a targeted um, patented mechanical system or anything like that that we utilize. We, we really actually, using my engineering background, take a little bit of a side before I answer your question. So after um, I graduated from Purdue in 2012 with my uh, Bachelor's of Science in Environmental and natural resources with a focus on water engineering. I took a job as co doing consulting engineering to learn just real world engineering experiences. I knew that I needed that to really, at this point in time, I knew kind of, like I said, that inkling to start my organization had started to become more and more strong. And I knew that I was going to need my, my, engineering skill set really finally honed and, and have a professional experience that I could then bring into making 
the organization that I ultimately felt called to start a reality and, and be able to do it effectively. So kind of along that journey, um, I was developed as I was developing my engineering skill set, I got my professional engineering license. Um, I came to learn that, you know, the key with water and wastewater solutions. So, you know, this one water view is not so much about, especially in developing countries and certain communities, certain solutions and technologies work, but they don't work in others. And, and really what's needed is a toolbox of solutions to address any particular community's need. Um, I'm not in, in and of myself. I'm not an inventor. I don't have that kind of skill set. But what I do really well is identify technologies that can work to address solutions. So that's what we've done. We have a toolbox of solutions that we can come into a community and we can say, OK, we're going to figure out what your situation looks like. We're going to figure out where the nearest viable water source is, what the quality of that water source is. And we're going to figure out um, how we're going to get the water to you in a central location where you can come and get it. We're going to figure out what technologies, if any, do we need to treat that water? What's going to be best for you? We're not going to make that decision for you. We're going to bring a, a short list of options from our toolbox, if you will, okay. um, that can work from you. And these are solutions, technologies, treatment, conveyance technologies, um, power technologies that we're leveraging from other groups, other providers, other manufacturers, other suppliers that are already out there on the market, right? But then we identify, okay, hey, these are the top four that will work for your community. Okay. But we don't want to make the decision for them. We want them to be included in that process because that's really the key to the sustainable change. So if anything, our key differentiator is not like a particular technology or a particular you know, solution method. It's really a, a process. It's, it's what we've been able to develop to empower these people, to educate and train and equip them so that they can become owners of the solutions long after we've left. So that's really what we've been able to hone as our kind of key differentiator and what helps us to be successful in what we're doing. Right. So you facilitate the uh, given circumstances and you make sure that they get the best out of what they have. All right. Very good synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so uh, when you are addressing these uh, water, sanitation and hygiene challenges in different communities, uh, how far have you been successful in addressing each of them? Or is it that you deal with only one issue at the moment and then you think about the rest? Uh, it, it's not a integrated thing. It's something that you take as point to point. Yes. So we're one community at a time focused. Um, now, there might be scenarios we haven't run into yet, but we're, we're definitely aware that this could be a possibility where there, where there could be communities that are kind of geographically clumped together, local, locally located, where we could implement a solution um, that would be able to service all three of those communities. We haven't done that yet, um, but obviously we, we take one project at a time. Um, and to date, we've served 9,000 plus people with access to clean water. And in addition to that, in the first community we ever served, we also did a wastewater, so that kind of one water view um, solution as well to improve their overall water situation. So yeah, it is kind of very much um, a, a bespoke, decentralized system that we've and, and process that we kind of take to to serve these communities. We don't have this kind of big grandiose like you know municipality level you know utility level view on it because that's just not that's just not financially feasible for us or for these communities um and this level of complexity to make that happen can become very challenging correct yeah uh, talking of challenges uh, you must need to collaborate with uh, local partners or organizations even the government perhaps to maximize the impact of your initiatives Absolutely. All three, we have to. Um, we want to ultimately recognizing two things that are kind of key. Again, this is one of the things that for us um, 
is so important is to recognize that if something that is integral to our mission in the way that we actually deliver on a project in a particular community uh, is of high enough value and importance, such as like ensuring empowerment um, for sustainable change in these communities, then that needs to be that needs to transcend all of our efforts in these countries that we're working in. And so that what that looks like is so not just in the community where we're working, but when we enter a, a country or enter a region of a country, um, our whole vision is that we want to form strategic partnerships um, with other NGOs, with champions and partners on the ground, both in the communities we're working in directly, but also at a regional level, as well as with the government agencies. And also along the way, equipping and economically um, empowering through the sub consultants and the contractors that we hire to do Agencies, certain parts yes. of the work. Um, for instance, when we have to collect topographic survey data to understand the lay of the land, so we know what it, our solution is gonna be able to look like and how that's gonna work as far as what sort of um, elevation changes we're gonna have to deal with to get our water source mm -hmm. from where it is to the center of the community, right? Those kind of things like that, we hire local sub consultants. We don't bring in our own people. We hire locals because again, it's all part of that empowerment approach. And it's only integrated with this understanding concept that the more we can in include these partners, these sub consultants, these government agencies, these local champions and partners in the process, um, the more sense of ownership that they'll have, the more empowered they will be, the more equipped they will be, and the more sustainable our solutions will be. And along the way, what we're doing is we're kind of injecting life, right, into, into these communities, giving them, like, in these regions, giving them, like, a, a sense of, like, we can do this, right? Ultimately, hopefully, hopefully such that long after we've left, they, they are the ones that can take over um, and really be the drivers of future change. Correct, right. They need to take ownership of that. Let's take a break to understand what Jazuba is. Everyone at some point ponders on how this beautiful life can be made more meaningful. Maybe you're a leader trying to enhance your employees' experience at your organization. Or you already work for the community and seek volunteers with state-of-the-art skills to strengthen your nonprofit. Whatever your situation, know that you can make a difference. Chizuba began with this very vision, a vision to facilitate every skill and every passion in the world in meeting a social need. Corporate volunteering has several benefits for both businesses and organizations. In parallel, experienced and enthusiastic volunteers join NGO workers, enabling them to serve the community more effectively. Chizuba offers everyone looking to add purpose and meaning to their lives a chance to connect or volunteer virtually with non-profit organizations from over 100 countries around the world. Visit www.chizuba.net and explore opportunities to find meaning. Chizuba, your platform to do good. And now, back with our guest. Uh, in all these... Uh you know, days and months and years that you have worked with uh, Vera Aqua, Vera Vita. Vita. You, uh, Vita, okay. So uh, this is, uh, do you remember any particular incident that was particularly uh, memorable or is it's very vivid in your memory? Yeah. I mean, so I mentioned the, the trip to Haiti, but that was before the start of Vera Aqua, Vera right? Before started, yes. Um, yeah, but honestly, there's been many. Um, very many. Uh, one in particular is in the first community we ever served, the community of Monte Castillo. It's a community of um, about six to seven thousand people at the time when we provided access to, to clean water. There's a man who was working in the, I'm going to put this in quotes, quote unquote, um, utility 
that was managing the water and wastewater systems that they had in the community there. They had some infrastructure. They have some infrastructure, I should say, was not in very good condition or anything of what we would believe or accept to be okay, functional um, water, wastewater system. But that's what they had. He was a part of this um, utility agency that was managing it. His name was Manuel or is Manuel. And and he's in the prime of his life. He's like mid thirties and he consumed contaminated water. Um, we don't know exactly what source it was that he drank, but he got parasites um, into his brain, um, like a worm um, was in the water. It got up into his brain and he is now paralyzed from the waist down. Um, he has, uh, de- he has very, very decreased motor skills. Um, his, you know, speech is very limited. Um, oh he's in a wheelchair. And I met this man, Manuel. I met him when we first started working in the community, when we were really just getting our feet wet, and pun intended, um, with figuring out how we're going to do what we now do with Veraca Vita. This is like very, very early stages for us as an organization. It was our first project. Um, and that was way back in 2016, 2017, when I met him. Well, about a year later, a year and a half later, um, when we were finally starting to break, when we were finally about to break ground on construction for our water treatment facility that we put in place in that community, um, we ran into Manuel again, and that's when we saw him in the wheelchair. Oh, that's so sad. Um, and learned his whole story. And this is a man that was, you know, arguably in the prime yeah. of his life. He's mid thirties, yeah. healthy, knew better than to drink contaminated water because he was working in the utility, exactly. you know, had some yes. knowledge. Um, but from what we could gather from our conversations with him and his family, um, he, they just didn't have any other choice but to drink that water that they knew was probably contaminated. And, and so that was the reality. And if that could happen to a man like him, then what is happening to the vulnerable in our society and their community, right? The children, the elderly, those that have pre, you know, pre-existing health conditions, like what are going to be the impacts of dirty, contaminated water on those people's quality of life, right? And so like that was really, for us, that was really another strong affirmation that the work that we are doing is so important. Absolutely. Um, Very much needed. Yes, yes. Well, um, uh, that's a, a very touching story, actually. I, I mean, he, he would have definitely wished for you to have come there earlier, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the other thing, too, Tej. Um, the whole thing is the quicker we can do these projects, the more yes. people that we can serve, the more lives we can save, right? The children, the elderly, the most vulnerable. Every 90 seconds, a child under the age of five is dying from waterborne illness somewhere in the world. Mm-hmm. Something that we so consider as basic, This is an uh, urgent matter, right? Um, and so that's for us at the top of our mind. Yeah, absolutely. So are you planning on uh, reaching out to other countries as well? Or you do you have your hands full at the moment? Yeah, so right now our hands are full in Peru. Um, we're, we're working 100% in the Pura region of Peru. It's in northwestern Peru on the Ecuadorian border. Um, yeah, Climate-wise, they get less than yeah. Yeah, climate-wise, they get I, less than. Uh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I was just looking at your website and I saw that visualization uh, that you have on the screen, and it tells you the story of where you are located, how you started off, and what was the condition before and after. And there's a lovely. Mm-hmm. Uh, a visual which leads to the story of a young girl. Yes. Uh, her name is Maya. Alcira. Oh, Maya. Alcira, Maida. Yes. Or Alcira. Maida, yeah, I think yes. it's Alcira. Yes. Yeah. It's a beautiful story and uh, something that uh, you know classrooms across the world can use. So I'm telling this on my podcast. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, sorry, that's a good point. No, no, no worries. That's really good. And I'm sorry, I can I can get going on certain topics and it's hard to slow me down. So uh, please don't have, have, hesitate to interject if you want to redirect the conversation. Uh, but no, you're right. I mean, what, where our work is in Peru um, right now is, is for us, um, we just turned six years old as an organization, um, literally last week, a week ago today. And so we're finally, and you know, keep in mind, COVID was right smack dab in the middle of like our first few years as an organization here. Um, so we got started, we completed our first project. It went under construction in 2018. It commenced operations in 2019. And then about six months later, COVID hit. And for two years or more, we were essentially like hand tied, unable to do much work at all um, in Peru because of the, the impacts of COVID shutting down all the operations down there. And our work was not considered considered essential services mm. by the government down there. And they had the, they had the largest outbreak of uh, COVID ca- cases per capita in the world um, in Peru. And so on the backdrop of all of that, like we were kind of forced to kind of go back to the drawing board and really, instead of, focus on project project and program delivery, we really started building out our processes and our programs and our frameworks and our delivery methodologies on how we actually go about functionally succeeding and when we come into a community and follow through with the project. Um, And so we worked on developing our uh, um, program, which is our WASH education and uh, general theology of the body education workshop, which is kind of a part of what we do to ensure sustainability in these communities to equip them with knowledge. We also started working on scoping out and uh, building a pipeline of future projects and prioritizing those and building out a process where from day one, when we enter a community, we can do multiple levels of surveys at various tiers, the different populations in the community to evaluate the, the true need in that community. And then we can feed that into a scorecard tool that we've developed and prioritize which communities we're gonna serve. And so following COVID, we've kind of started that process of serving the first of those six communities. We finally implemented that education workshop that we developed in the first community we ever served the Monte Castillo. And we developed this My You Storybook that you just mentioned to kind of help us tell the story for these six communities that we're going to be serving, or sorry, seven that that we're going to be serving. One we're serving already right now. And then we have six more over the next um, few years that we're going to serve. And we can use, we using like real hard data from the surveys that we collected in these communities, like actual like waterborne illness rates, actual child mortality rates, all that stuff kind of built into like a, a storybook framework with a fictional character of Mayu. Um, we can tell the story for the need in each of these communities and leverage that to help us raise the funds and get the support that we need to actually give clean water to these communities. Wonderful. Uh, yes, I know you have those. Uh, I'm sure you can reach out to more people with those kind of visuals. Uh, I do know of a couple of organizations that are working in uh, Africa that, that have been on my podcast that could use your help. So uh, maybe I can share your connect with them and you, you can see how it goes beyond that. Sure, I'd love to talk. Well, it was lovely talking to you today. Uh, great to know about Vera Aqua Vera Vita. And uh, you have the blessings of a lot of people. You are providing something as basic as water, something that every human being, every living organism needs. So uh, you are indeed uh, getting a lot of blessings from the universe. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's very humbling and rewarding work. And yeah, like you said, it's a fundamental need. It's a fundamental right to life. Um, and for us, you know, the way the way I kind of view all that we do, and and all there's obviously many needs 
in developing countries and in, in the develop in the underdeveloped countries in our in regions sure. in our world. Um, food, shelter, clothing, economic, you know, activities and opportunities. There's so but much to for do. me and my experience at the core of all of that, um, it and if we don't address this particular issue of water, water and wastewater solutions, you know, that's the core that's going to hold these True. communities, these people back from any sort of economic development or growth. Yes. I mean, think yes. about it. There's kind of two things that really I will use to sum up for us why I believe what we do is so fundamentally important. Um, the number of hours and dollars lost annually um, due to the simple reality that people don't have access to clean water um, is astronomical. We're talking about children that can't get an education. We're talking about wives and women that can't hold down a job. We're talking about men that can barely get by and supporting their family because they're struggling daily to get their ac get access to clean water or they're constantly ill um, because they have waterborne illnesses. I mean, can you imagine having, I'm sorry to be crass, but diarrhea every day of your life? I mean, like yeah, the impacts on your energy, on your, you know, your overall feeling of well-being and productivity would be severely limited, right? Um, Absolutely. Then that, you know, that's many, many hours lost. And what does that equate to? That equates to economic, um, you know, shortfalls. That equates to economic challenges. That equates to we can't raise any money because we're constantly built, barely Absolutely. trying to survive, right? Yes. So for us, it's, that's why it's so important. Our work is that fundamental meeting that fundamental need for water and wastewater services. Basic one water can really start the process of getting the ball rolling to move them from simply surviving to, to begin to truly thrive. Absolutely. Totally. I agree with uh, all that you said. Well, as we conclude this episode, uh, we are reminded of the immense power of individuals and organizations in creating a ripple effect of positive change and better living for all. So every drop counts. And I don't know how, how, how I can emphasize this even more by talking about water as being a fundamental right that every single living organism needs. Let us do our bit. Indeed.